Hello amateurs and welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another amazing guest for you today. I played with this man at Old Colfian's Rugby Club. He's a cross-code legend and I've only ever been to one rugby league game in my life and this man was the man that organised it. Please welcome Mr Andrew Foster. Foster, how are you? I'm very good, Tim. How are you? Very well, indeed. Now, let's start with that Rugby League Grand Final. Tell me, just tell the people about what it's all about and why you started organising those down south. That, that's a good question. I mean, it's funny, it goes all the way back to when I was a pupil at Bradford Grammar School and there was not a big uh sports section in the library but one of the books was endless winter by stephen jones the 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 sunday times journalist and i remember um as a you know child rugby league fan reading his chapter in that about rugby league and it's not very complimentary about rugby league but it did mention how um he there was always a tradition of the third 15 organizing their end of year trip to the to the Challenge Cup final. Um, and so it, I'd always had this in the back of my mind. And so when, after after COVID, when the sort of crowds were coming back, and particularly with um, the Challenge Cup being taken to Tottenham Hotspur, which is an amazing stadium, uh, I, myself and Fred Humphreys, who is another Old Coliseum player, uh, another rugby league fan, just thought, why don't we see if there's any take up for it? So we asked around and very quickly realised, actually, we could fill a bus here. Um, and 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 who doesn't like a bus trip, um, especially a bus trip where you don't even have to <laughs> get your boots on and play. You can just enjoy yourself. So, so, yeah, it works out to be a really just, yeah, just a great day. We met at the club, beautiful sunny day, sport, you know, there's, there's all the um, games on from Australia and a bit of cricket on the telly. We had a we had a breakfast. Then the bus turns up. We all pile onto it. Um, drive up to Tottenham from South London. Um, great pubs round round the new stadium. Get into the ground. Fantastic, you know. Some closest I get. Uh, I guess you get to the NFL uh, level stadium experience in the UK. Um, watch. Two fantastic games, and then um, and then back on the bus and back um, back to the club where we we already had a curry um, organised um, and yeah just topped off topped off a great day. I think I think every club should think about doing it. I think the uh, Old Cold Fiends did pretty well over the bar from us um, in the morning and in the evening, and everyone had a really great time. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly why I brought this up specifically is because, you know, just to be creative, for clubs to think about different ways of engaging members, and it doesn't even have to be the same exact sport. Well, now no. tell me, what do people make of rugby league? Because obviously, you know, we've seen it on the telly enough, but, you know, there's very few genuine rugby league fans, I would say, amongst the Southern contingent. But what was your kind of, what were people saying to you, Foz? It's interesting that I think, it is so when I start I came down I came down south for the first time for university in 2000 and I remember a lot of skepticism uh, <laughs> about rugby league but it was already on on the change a bit and you do get I think NRL Australian rugby league has made a massive leap forwards in terms of the athleticism I think the you know the tries in the corner because you know the corner flag is now um, in play where it used to be out of play. You've got video ref, so you can have frame by frame. So you get absolutely spectacular um, plays, pretty much guaranteed every game. So I think you've got you've got a sliding scale. So down at Old Cole Fins, there are some um, that, well, there are some uh, transplanted Northerners like myself. Um, who <laughs> you know, like who have brought their rugby league fandom down with them. Um, but there are also some local, you know, like South London through and through, who have grown to to really appreciate it. It doesn't mean 
they uh, they've given up on union. The the opposite, I think. Um, and then you still get some who'll you know happily take the Mickey, um, and and that's fair enough. And that's all part of the part of the laugh as well, I think. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it you know how how it continues to to develop, especially with increasingly you've got these um, summer amateur rugby league clubs. So you've got more and more sort of cross pollination between the codes, even in what you'd say are traditionally rugby union areas. So, yeah, it's one to keep an eye on. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, you mentioned NRL there, and I'm interested in, in what you think about their season kickoff that they've just recently had with the the video that they produced and it that you know the opening games being in Las Vegas. What did you yes. what did you make of that? I think they're just really serious. I think they. So, one of the issues with rugby league in the in the UK has been a bit of a inferiority complex, a bit of a suspicion that those things aren't made for the like of us. Whilst NRL, I mean, they've already got the the um, three letter acronym uh, starting with N, and I think they see they don't see any reason why they shouldn't get up there with. Uh, in in some, you know, they're not ever going to be on NFL, NBA level. But I think the NHL, people who know more about it than me, the NHL is a good, you know, is a good guide how, unlike, you know, so <laughs> unlike rugby league that can be played anywhere, I mean, ice hockey, there's an obvious <laughs> sort of climate bias. And yet um, NHL has spread south to some you know to to uh to Arizona and Florida and you know all these famously sunny places so so yeah I think it's just really exciting I know I'm very lucky to know a few people who know a few people and the the developments that could be happening in NRL over the next few years I just think it just shows ambition and confidence in what what rugby you know in this case league um i think it's true for you know you see you see similar things in what i saw bill beaumont saying the other day you know it doesn't have to you know we know how rugby league and rugby union have been a, in the last century and um, we can take pride in that but we can also have a think about um the potential to get more people involved to make our you know our big games even bigger and just get more people enjoying it and give ourselves more to enjoy in that score. Yeah, I think there's definitely room for growth there and people are slowly heading in that direction. Let's go back to the beginning, though, Foz, because I'm interested. Yes. You mentioned there the cross-pollination of codes, you know, playing sort of union in the winter and league in the summer. Um, yeah. Me, as a Southern softie growing up, there was only one code. But what, was, what is it like growing up in, like, genuine rugby league territory where well, you've got... You no, know, you've got both options. Um, I was a northern softy, so I only I, I I played so I played union at school. I I got into it. I got into rugby. I I I had very little contact with it in primary school, but then it was it seemed to be the core curriculum at Bradford Grammar. You know, like rugby first, then maybe maths and English, um, and and then I I joined a a club on the Sunday um, because my mates were playing there, a rugby union club. Um, so was was at one point, I think I was doing eight session training sessions or games a week, uh, just union, union, union. Um, but I would also be watching Bradford Northern. It started off being um, Bradford Bulls changed the name in 95 when the, the game went to summer. Um, and, and there's a lot, you know, so Charlie Hodgson, who I guess most people will know was year above me, um, playing, you, you know, he was, he, he, he played for Bradford Grammar, he played for Old Broads Rugby Union, but he was a Halifax Rugby League fan. And that was sort of the, the way of it really, you know, like all the, you know, even the people who played Union would be watching league, um, you know, would tend to follow a league team. Um, one thing that really struck me was um, the first year that we played competitive games against other schools, 
we were unbeaten all year. And then we went and played um, Queggs Wakefield. And I know through you know, one of my mum's best mates, um, her son is there. Queggs Wakefield obviously played union at school, but they all were all playing for league clubs on a Sunday. And we turned up unbeaten and got absolutely hammered. Because and I, and I do think this is a you know a, I, I don't think it's coincidence. I think it's it's just a good varied diet. If you're if you're a un, you know very you know if you're a young union player, then playing some league seems to just do something for your running, for your tackling, for your uh, catching, for your for your sort of core skills of rugby. That um, um, yeah, certainly put us in our place. And uh, <laughs> so so yeah, I was. I mean, I'm a hooker in rugby union, and uh, I don't. I don't really have an equivalent position in league. You know, like in the few games of league that I've played, I haven't really known, <laughs> known where to go. Um, so, so I am, yeah, I, I'd be the worst crossroads. <laughs> sort of, uh, set, you know, like my my strengths are hooking the ball against the head and vaguely knowing what to do in rooks and walls and just running about um, a fair bit uh, and, and getting to the breakdown and what have you. So... So yeah, so I, I, I've I've been very much a union player, league watcher, and I think that's quite a common model amongst certainly amongst people of my age uh, up in Yorkshire. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned '95 there is when uh, league went to the summer. I didn't know that was the case, but it was also the same year that union turned professional. Uh, uh, yes, league, wasn't it? so there was that big confluence of all these kind of changes at the same time, and I remember it well because. Um, yeah, I was just sort of coming out of school and some of the guys that I played with in representative rugby then went and played in that amazing cross code series between Bath and Wigan. What are yes. your sort of memories of, of that little uh, jaunt? <laughs> yes, I mean, that was I mean, that was massive in rugby league because there had been. I think that's one thing that people, you know, sometimes people, you don't realise they don't even know about um the fact that rugby league players could be banned you know not just from playing rugby union literally banned from um stepping foot you know on the on the, the ground uh banned from being a spectator properly ostracized so there was quite a lot of built up um tension and, and resentment that came out in that you know rugby league fans were generally like a bit gutted that Wigan didn't properly put Bath to the sword, that it was only 80 points. Like they took off Edwards, they took off um uh Andy Farrell and Henry Paul, I think. I think they played a fair bit of it with 12 men. And um so so yeah, so there was a few rugby league fans who were like, you should have you should have made a proper point. And they were um they were really hopeful that they would go and actually win at Twickenham in the union. Um and I think that betrays a bit of a, you know, I mean, Wigan actually played Graham West, who was the retired, who was their coach, who'd retired from playing years ago. They played him in the um, in the Union game because they knew, I mean, he's a he's a Kiwi. I presume he had quite a Union background, and they knew he'd be quite useful from that store. Um, so yeah, so it's a bizarre, you know, it's really interesting time. Um, and it's it's strange in a way that it's never happened again since, seeing as you'd have thought it would potentially be a bit of a money spinner. I mean, like what what did you think of it at the time as a uh, you know, like coming at it from the Southern Union perspective? Well, I just found it like wildly exciting, to be honest. You know, and there was all the sort of questions that get thrown up, isn't there? Like about Who's going to win? I mean, we yeah. fairly thought that, you know, the union team would win the game in, in union and the league team would win the game in league. But by how much and what would, you know, what, what would the strengths and weaknesses of each team come through and see? But, yeah, I guess um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, in terms of it happening again, like... The, you know, the pressure on games, the pressure on players, the, you know, the amount of fatigue, all of that kind of yeah. stuff. And then even more so nowadays, probably safety, they're probably looking at and going, there's no way we could do it. Whereas back in those days, you know, although it was still incredibly 
physical in both codes in different ways. Like it felt like you could you could pitch up and do it. You know, it wasn't as professional as it is nowadays, maybe. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think I think some in some ways rugby union should give itself a bit of a bit bit more of a break in that it is um nineteen ninety five really isn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things in terms of in terms of the professional game. And so it's not surprising that there have been growing pains. Like some of that should possibly have been, you know, avoided. Um, some of that seems to be the sort of same mistakes again, where local, you know, local eccentric millionaire pumps a lot of money into a team. They go up through the divisions and then um, for whatever reason, the money, money stops and then they lose a hundred nil every week for three years. Um you know, so we don't need to run that experiment <laughs> again. We know what happens there. Uh, but, yeah, I think, I mean, I think back to that time, you know, I was um, sort of coming up, I, I was coming up to the end of junior rugby and into the Colts and playing a bit of senior rugby. And, and my memory is that every, you know, at the time, every club thought they could get in the top flight. Every club seemed to have a plan to to conquer the premiership. Um, even at the sort of lower levels, every coach thought they were Clive Woodward and um, were looking for marginal gains and, and all this sort of stuff. I think a lot of good stuff came out of that. Um, uh, maybe, some, <laughs> you know, sort of like maybe, maybe some questionable stuff. Um, but it's, yeah, I... I I'd be I'd be interested to read a book on it, you know, thinking about it because it was, yeah, it's it's a bizarre. I don't know how much of a coincidence it was that Union Union went um, pro and League went to summer. I think it's all tied up with the the Super League war that took place in Australia, where there was a battle between Murdoch and Kerry Packer uh, because Australian Rugby League is basically their equivalent of. Uh, or, or a close equivalent of um, football, you know, English Premier League football in terms of just is your TV channel going to sink and sink or swim? Uh, and and that meant that even though British Rugby League was a uh, was very much a um, a sort of poor relation, they were still politically important. And Murdoch said, "Here's eighty seven million to be on on my team." Uh, and 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 so and so that's why rugby league switched to summer that you know at that time and uh, and then you know uh, the union the union coming across so you got you got the likes of Robbie Paul Gary Conley um, going across and having sort of guest guest stints with um, with Quins. Uh, Twigamala went over to Wasps and then came back for Wigan and then. I think he ended up at Newcastle full time, um, and it sort of laid the pathway to Jason Robinson um, going, going, you know, sort of full time over there. Um, and and I think that's probably a bit of a, you know, will be seen as quite a big moment in in the history of both codes, really. Yeah, that was a really big moment, wasn't it? Because he was, you know, right in his prime, still, what was it, sort of mid to just mid past his mid 20s, maybe? Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, so he was, <laughs> I know this because he was like 17. Um, I reckon he was 17 in 93 when he was man of the match against us in the Regal Trophy final. Um, so if he's 17 in 93 and he went across, yeah, it'd be mid 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 20, I mean, plenty of rugby in him. Yeah, it's kind of a changing of the tide, wasn't it? You know, up until that point, it was it was a lot of union players going to league for the money. Yeah. You know, people like uh, Scott Quinnell, just off the top of my head there. Um, and then it was yeah, it was almost like the tide turned, and it's not really ever gone back the other way. I just think maybe Luther Burrell might be the only one that's sort of gone gone back. Yeah, there's been odd, strange. You know, Gareth Thomas. Andy Powell, maybe at the end of his career, you know, like people at the end of their careers. Um, Gavin Henson played some third tier rugby league very briefly and then went back to running a pub. Um, <laughs> but no, not you, Jonathan Davies, like massive, 
um, you know, sort of world new signings, which is, a sh- you know, Wales Rugby League. I mean, that's been a massive loss for um, Rugby League as that Wales are now sort of relying really on heritage players um, as opposed to that, you know, the 95 team uh, got to, you know, blend of heritage and then, you know, union converts got to the semi-final, weren't far off beating England, could easily have beaten Australia in the final, been world champions with Jonathan Davis leading it. Um, but then because because Union's gone pro, because actually there's been, you know, the the they have there hasn't been that sort of going north thing. And that is that has not just much reduced Wales rugby league as a team. But also, it's meant that there's not much difference between England Rugby League and Great Britain Rugby League, uh, and 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 Great Britain Rugby League was, and and should still be a mass, you know, a massive thing that um, uh, uh, it's got, you know, it's got a, over a century of history and incredible uh, tussles with Australia that you'd hope we'll we'll see again at some point. Um, yeah, I'm hopefully there's a lot of good work going on in terms of Wales Rugby League, um, building from the grassroots. And who knows? Uh, it'd be nice to see it come back somewhere near the strength that it once once had. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's move on to old Cole Fiennes, uh yeah. things. Boss, how did you first get involved in the club? So I, I, I joined the school as a teacher. And I think I I could be right. You know, I'm sure some of your viewers, listeners will cor- correct me. But Old Cole Fiends feels like one of the most genuine, you know, old, sort of school old whateverians teams that there is. You know, like most most games that I've played, I've looked around the changing room, and it's more than half the people are former pupils of the school. You know, like I'm. I'm only a, you know, teacher at the school. Um, there's there's people who I taught when they were eleven who are now like in their in their twenties, knocking on for their thirties. Um, and so so yeah, it was a great. I mean, it's a great club. Um, it's it's in a great location. Uh, it's. They they get that balance right though in that you it it, it is old cold fiends. It has got that strong link with the school, and you know people have been mates since they were since they were kids. However, there are plenty of people who have no connection with the school but have come down because it's their local club, and they're welcomed in just as much as anyone else. So I think they they get the best of both worlds really. And it's a great, you know, I think Kent, I've always said, you know, one of my little hobby horses and it might be changing. It looks like wasps might be onto it. I find it very strange that Kent is such a virulent rugby area and yet all the the top flight teams are on the other side of London. Um, my, honestly, I think if someone let put, whether it was a league or a union team at Millwall, so you are... Five minutes from London Bridge, you have a fan park in um, Borough Market um, and you play the games on a Thursday or a Friday night. Um, and, and you know, you make a buzz around London Bridge for people, even if they don't go to the game, they know, you know, they know it's on. And, um, yeah, I think because obviously, you know, things have changed at, at Millwall, but it's still, you know, a lot of people <laughs> still have associations with, with um, you know, like <laughs> what they think when they hear of Millwall. If you had if you had rugby there, uh, then you take advantage of the fact that it's so it's so close to the city, it's so close to all these great transport links, and basically all of Kent. You know, if you're anywhere near a train station, you can get there as quick as anywhere um, in you know in 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 London. So um, I do think, yeah, it's. You know, it's a great it's a great place to play your rugby. Um, it's you know, I always enjoy going out into into more sort of like rural Kent and playing 
and then there's some some good teams in the sort of like in the surrounds in sort of Met Kent, uh, South East London, uh, that we we have some good historic tussles with as well. Yeah, tell me about what it's like to um, play alongside some former pupils in Fos. There must be some uh, <laughs> moments there. The the classic one is when they shout "sir" at you, and the ref <laughs> turns around. The ref's like, "What?" <laughs> They're like, "No, he was talking to me. Uh, don't worry, <laughs> you know." I talk. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm still teaching. You know, because obviously, once they're seventeen, they can play senior rugby, and because I you know, play third 15, that's where they tend to, you know, younger lads tend to play. So I can actually be playing alongside one lad on a on a Saturday and then, um, you know, marking their own work on a Sunday. But, um, yeah, no, it's been great. I think, I think a good thing, you know, I've always found it as a, um, as a teacher that actually um, kids, young people, they're quite good at observing those boundaries and what have you and and just not you know like the issue you know just just the issues that that when I was a young teacher I would probably be sort of like worried about um looking silly and losing authority or something like that whilst now actually yeah it just it, it's never been a it's never been an issue at all and um and they know where the light you know it's not like when on a monday morning you know if you are um teaching someone that you've played with on the saturday they always know right that was that was saturday now it's monday and we're back in lessons and i i need to um i need to do what i'm told uh so so yeah no i've always enjoyed it yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking back then myself. I don't think I ever played with any of my teachers, but I played against one of them um, after I'd left the school. And like when I first got to know him, this guy was like big and strong. He actually played yeah. on the wing. I didn't realise until much later. But, you know, by the time I got old enough to be in the same pitch, you know, we kind of were the same sort of size. So it was uh, it was interesting to sort of match up against somebody that you would sort of looked up to for such a long time. I have got a story. So when I was a schoolboy, um, the, when I was at under sixteen, um, we provided the opposition, the 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 um, what would you call it, semi opposed um, for the teachers team who were playing their first, you know, first game in in living memory against another school, and um, yeah, we literally played for two two minutes, and I was coming into a rook, bang. Like literally spanked in the face by the by one of my teachers. It was like, ho oh, oh, ho, sorry, Andy. Old habits die hard. Ho oh, 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 ho oh, ho oh. ho. And I was like, oh right. Um, but it was a different time. These were the nineties in Yorkshire. So, you know, I didn't really think anything certainly didn't cross my mind to uh flag it up or anything. But um I took it was all right. Um karma got him. Um he he um bust a rib in like the second minute of playing so um like the the day after um we came into his classroom and he had the curtains beautiful sort of like sunny day but he had all the curtains drawn and the lights low and he was sat in the corner like sort of wheezing and we all came in and sat down uh and we were in silence for a couple of minutes anyway i'm in a great deal of pain <laughs> take notes from page 43 if you've got any questions, I will endeavour to answer, but I'd rather not. <laughs> and just sat there, we were just like, right. Uh, and that was the lesson, just sat there taking notes while he, it was a bit, it reminded me of, uh, you know, like um, a broken set of bagpipes. And he just <laughs> like, <laughs> he just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all, all even now, okay in the end with that one, but. But yeah, um, it's nice that now, you know, obviously we're in the age of health and safety and more sort of um, mindful about, you know, like right ways to go about things as teachers. But it's still, you know, it still works and um, and it's and it's nice to see. Yeah. Um, right. You mentioned there about sort of third 15 and, and getting players involved. I know we're in similar WhatsApp groups, so I see all the work you do. But what are the kind of the challenges and the solutions maybe that you've found to sort of recruiting players, getting a team out on the pitch? 
that is it. I mean, like, I think, I mean, I'm generally really interested that just from a, you know, a sort of problem solving, sort of, you know, like I see it like a sort of Rubik's Cube, uh, that it it's it's clearly an issue all over the all over the place. I think a lot of people get drawn into just getting frustrated and putting a a, a cross message on the on the big chat to 200 people saying everyone needs to pull their finger out da 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 and and i just don't think that what i think that just reinforces that most people aren't turning up and it makes it you know if anything it validates um people who who you know are are pretty lax about about showing up whether they've ticked available or not what what we try to do so we we we've tried to create we call it the tree where we we say right instead of just having a director of rugby chasing 200 people what if we break it down so you've got branches so you have some of your more committed established people players um sometimes not even don't have to be players but they've each got instead of chasing hundreds they've each got a dozen or even half a dozen and that way, you're actually creating a uh, just a human connection. There's a bit more accountability, and you can tell that if you know, like, so we had, you know, there's one lad who couldn't come um, for quite a while because he was going through the adoption process. You know, like he was, <laughs> you can't get more. You know, like you can't get a better excuse than, oh yeah, so. So I need to be here to meet the social workers, you know, like and and go through all this this life changing stuff that will allow us to become parent of this child that we're hoping to become parent of. Um, but you only get, you know, you only are likely to get that depth of understanding and also to know of the people you're talking to who is more likely genuinely ill. And who is just nursing a hangover and needs a, just a bit of coaxing on a Saturday morning? Um, it's a bit of a Mister Macorber thing, um, where you know, like the whole thing about you know, like you know, sort of um, misery. You know, like half a half a shilling short misery, half a shilling over happiness. If you can get to the end of a third team game with fifteen people on the field, happiness by and large. If you're if you're starting with fourteen, even if you're starting with a bare fifteen, and the oh the other element of it is is it sometimes you know if you aren't regulating it, you end up with a bench of ten, twelve, and and then you're then you got a problem of keeping people happy. This they're they're not getting enough rugby, you know, like they they only get twenty minutes or what have you. So so yeah, I think it's. You know, I'm not claiming I've cracked it by any means. Um, and I've I've been away from, you know, like with with what's been going on with me, I've been away from it um, for the most part last couple of years. Um, but what we found is when you get when you get organized about it, when you get systematic about it, then you can have quite a big impact and it gets a lot less stressful and it becomes a bit of a virtuous circle where people enjoy playing. They want to play more, and 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 you can quickly end up looking at it and thinking, can we put, you know, instead of being, are oh, we going to have to scrap the third team, you can get to a point where you're like, are we going to actually start fielding a fourth team? Right, it's it's doable. Um, hopefully, we get there. Yeah, because when I first joined the club, there was a, a regular fourth team going out yeah. every week, and it became inevitable that it had to to fold and stop being a thing. So when I saw the whispers that a fourth team was potentially coming back in the climate where most people are really, you know, the teams are on the negative spiral all the time. I was really yes. sort of excited for the club that that was a potential, you know, next step. Yes. I think, you know, a lot of these issues are not, are not even rugby issues. They are, you know, there's, there's an expectation that uh, now that um, if you're, if you're a, dad then going out all saturday um every saturday between september and 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 april that's just 
you know, most people would see, you know, be be questioning that now, where perhaps 40 years ago, um, that would you know, be more seen as more socially acceptable. Um, so you've got that, you've got Netflix and, but, you know, I think that's one of the things where League and Union have seen each other as enemies. And and actually now they're they're in the same foxhole really, and they're up against they're up against Netflix, they're up against cheap holidays away, you know, people bobbing over to Prague or you know like lads weekend to Dublin or whatever else that that was a lot rarer um, a little while ago. But the flip side of it is where it used to be about ringing rounds. Now we've actually got means of getting in contact with pretty much everyone um in a light touch way um we can we can directly message them so it doesn't necessarily have to be a call that they pick up there and then um so there are advantages we got in the 2020s that we didn't have in the 1990s uh that, so we've got to make the most of them uh i think it's a massive use it or lose it situation too but um these clubs need nurturing and once they're gone, it's very hard to put them back. So, so if you've got a club that's got three teams out, it's got to be a, you know, and you, you know, fight, fight tooth and nail to keep that third team up. Um, because once it's gone, it's much harder to, to then, um, grow it out, and that's what that's what we found at Old Cold Fit. You know, there's been a bit of chat about get a fourth team back for a while. Um, it, it's it's hard. It's hard to um, it, it's hard to grow like that. So so the the best solution is not to lose the team in the first place. That's that's how it feels to me. Yeah, definitely. And if you are going to bring it back, I guess you want to make sure that it's going to be back to stay. Right? You don't want it to come and sort of pop back in and then disappear again in a year or so. No, 100%. I think that is where, yeah, I was talking to someone about, about this, you know, like the, um, in terms of setting up um, things where it needs people going, you know, often it's too reliant on one, one or two very keen volunteers who are like, you know, the, the heart and soul of it. And what you really want is a system where, yeah, of course, you've got committed people, but it doesn't need to be them. It doesn't collapse when they, you know, retire, move away, whatever else happens. You you want it to be something that can be taken over by the next person and and they keep everything that's good and they find their own tweaks that make it even better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, trouble is, I think <laughs> most clubs and most people like they haven't got the time to put all that system in place alongside doing all the work, haven't they? That's that's kind of another one of the common problems. Yeah, I think that I think you're right, and I think that's where it's about. Sit. I would say, you know, like my genuine my genuine feel would be that it's well if. If anyone is watching this and they feel like this describes their experience, that every week they're ringing around, they're spending hours and hours chasing players, and then by April they just collapse and they they will you know oh, I don't have to worry about that till late August September. That's your time where actually you want to sit down and think systematically the investment of time over the off season to work out how you can save yourself some of those hours week after week. That's, yeah, I, I think that is the way, that is the way forward. And and increasingly, you know, like there's, you know, there are sort of tech solutions. You know, I genuinely think treating, you know, and I know that particularly some of the sort of like the old boys in the bars are like, well, in my day, we were proud to be selected. Da, da. Shouldn't be chasing. Da, 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 da. Well, you are. You are chasing. You know, like it, it might stick in your craw to to be thinking of it. You know, you're trying to sell to you know, um, like all all my experience has been in men's rugby. 
um, for the most, you know, I've coached a bit of women's rugby uh, in and amongst, um, but um, the bulk of my experience is men's rugby and you're dealing with um, 17 to 35 year old men who are, yeah, they're, they're tricky to, <laughs> you know, they're tricky to nail that. Anyone who deals with that demographic knows it's, it's, it's a, it's a difficult um, group of people as a, as a whole. So we need to, we need to be systematic about it. Um, we need to think what's in it for them. We need to just bring some of those things that are standard sales techniques across and use it. So again, so you end up um, at least at the very minimum finishing with 15 on a Saturday rather than, you know, very quickly becomes a vicious circle where you get 12 out, um, you, you force a game, you get you get thrashed like people cry off mid game so then you get down to 11 then you get down to 10 someone says oh can we just call it you know you get some people want to carry on some people don't um and then it's even harder to get anywhere near 15 the next week so so we do have to you know we might not have to, might not like it might might wish that we could go back to the old day of the the secretary proudly issuing selection cards but you know we've got to deal with you know these are the cards we're dealt uh and the good news is we can do something with it and um and 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 get some some vibrant um teams back out even even in clubs where it feel might have felt up to now that things are a bit on the slide yeah some really good tactics there mate thank you thank you for all of those now, you kind of uh, alluded to it a little bit earlier, and you can see the beautiful pictures yeah. you've got in the background there in the shirt. Yeah. Who's Rycroft? Tell us tell us all about him. Yeah, so Rycroft is our son. Um, he he was born in February 2022. Um, we, we, he was born down in London. Um, he was born at Queen Charlotte, which uh, is right next to Wormwood Scrubs. So he had a nice... Nice view of the exercise yard. You can literally see the prisoners <laughs> from from uh, from the hospital room window. Uh, but um, but yeah, so he was born down. The reason he was born down at Queen Charlotte, even though we live uh, up in North Essex now, um, is that we knew we didn't know what it was. Knew there was some issue, um, and and three weeks uh, in, like so, three weeks after he was born. Genetic test came back and he had a condition called Schwatman Diamond Syndrome, uh, which is a very rare condition. Um, literally about 70 people in the UK who've, who've got it. Um, highly, you know, highly unfortunate that uh, everyone's a carrier for various sort of um, recessive genetic um, diseases. And you will never know unless you happen to meet someone, have a kid with someone. And even then, it's only a one in four chance with each child that the two recessive genes will will hit and and that and that child is a carrier. But unfortunately Rycroft was was a carrier. And then like one of the things with Schwartman Diamond syndrome is it affects your bone marrow and it's not unusual, you know something like one in four people with Schwartman Diamond syndrome end up with some sort of bone marrow failure or leukemia. Um, what was unusual with Rycroft is that this, the onset of his bone marrow failure was like in the like first year of his life, uh, which it's highly unusual. Um, he's, as far as we know, he's the youngest Schwatman Diamond uh, patient that um, has ever had a stem cell transplant in, in the UK. And maybe the third or fourth youngest in the world, which you know is is a big you know is a big ask because then the docs you know they're always looking for past precedent to help guide them with what they're doing. Um, so he had the the procedure began in March of last year, and everything was going well till till it wasn't. Unfortunately, he um, like he was even discharged. So he was down at Great Ormond Street. Um, everything seemed to go well. He was discharged, but then he had to go back in, and then he developed an infection. And unfortunately, you know, his 
his condition meant that he um, he was always very small, very difficult to absorb um, um, like lipids and uh, put on weight. So he was never, even though he was sixteen months, he never he never um, weighed much over six kilos. Um, and he got this infection and fought it a long time, but um, in the end, it was too much, and and he died in June uh, twenty. 23 um so so yeah and it's when i was saying you know it, it had occurred to me um you know we've got so he he was my second child you know he's our our second child uh we've got a four-year-old called lyra it did occur to me when she was born oh this means you know if you have a child it is possible that they could get ill they could die and what are you going to do then because everyone says that's the worst thing that that could happen um and yeah like, <laughs> it is um it's um it is a so you know i i haven't um i won't <sighs> there's an interesting thing great ormond street and um, run a helpline for bereaved parents and staffed by bereaved parents but you can only volunteer to be one of the people staffing it. So you can use it straight away, but you can only staff it after three years. And that's obviously, you know, slightly arbitrary, but also I think that's probably not a bad rule of thumb, you know, like three years length of a undergraduate degree. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm um, approaching the end of my first year as a bereaved parent and I would say I've got about a first year's level of knowledge and experience of it. And I've developed some ideas about it, but I I certainly won't claim to be the, the expert, if that makes sense. Um, and, and every day uh, brings, brings a bit more insight. You know, you get a lot of insight, you know, you end up in contact with a lot of other bereaved parents. Um, you end up talking, you know, one of my mates, it turns out, had had a sister who who died a similar age to Rycroft, but, you know, 30 odd years ago that I didn't even know about. Um, so, yeah, so it's a life, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I'm Rycroft's dad and I'll always be Rycroft's dad. And the nature of Rycroft's life means that it's been Rycroft's dad is is a sort of exceptional experience that um that i wouldn't give back i'm incredibly proud and happy that i'm right across dad but <laughs> there's obvious things with it that make it that make it tough and um yeah so so it's one foot in front of the other and keeping keeping going with stuff which um you know and which is why i'm really grateful to you tim for giving me the opportunity to to talk about it because um it does you know uh, there has this been this crossover with rugby um as well uh which i know you know about um and and that's that's been really powerful for us in in feeling like we're making progress yeah I mean, incredibly sorry for your loss, mate, and what you're going through. I can't, I can't even imagine. Um, how how would the how the rugby club been? How's the how's the sort of rugby family? Have they sort of supported you as well through throughout this? Yeah, I think this is where you need, like, obviously, you know, like your family and your close friends are your first port of call, but then you've got, um, yeah, that's. I mean, it has been incredible. Uh, so, you know, people, people, old call fans, people. Um, so I'm quite a active tweeter um, about rugby league, and so when I when I said, you know, like this has happened, and we're going to be trying to raise some money in his in his memory for for charities that um, that help children like him. Um, like the response of people, you know, sort of people, people I've never met, you know, some people who had 
sort of got to know a bit as much as you get to know people on social media, but other people, total strangers. Actually, one guy, <laughs> one guy, the the chairman owner of Lee Leopards, Derek Beaumont, who it would be fair, he would say himself, be fair to say our exchanges have not necessarily always been massively cordial. We <laughs> had disagreements about various things. But like he was one of the first, you know, early on, just just um donated a thousand pounds and said uh, you know, how sorry he was and shared it, shared it on his um social media, uh Hawkinson Rovers, uh and and their player um of the time he's moved to for now, Ethan Ryan, um, did their charity challenge for it. Uh Bradford Bulls hosted a hosted a game, and that's where so Bill Blythe, who I know you know, uh, um, I'll call Fians, um, Derek. I was up in Bradford for the um, for the match, Bradford Bulls versus Barrow, uh, and uh, you know where they had a bit of a sort of Rycroft tribute. We did a bucket collection and um, and a round of applause on the 16th minute, and Bill managed to coordinate for all the people who are in in London weren't able to get up there. They all met up at Philomena's, um, absolutely you know, top guy, uh, Claudio, uh, who's like the bar manager at Philomena's, help make sure that, Brad, you know, can't be many pubs in London showing Bradford Bulls versus Barrow <laughs> on, a, on a Tuesday night or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, and a load, you know, so they, but they had a, they had, you know, the pub was full of people cheering and you know it was one of the worst games I've ever seen <laughs> absolutely you know most people agree Bradford Bradford Bulls didn't have a bad season by their recent lights last year but that was arguably the, the worst they played all the year but but never mind that was, that wasn't important you know like what was important is you know it is that thing that that we all know that that your mates that you've got through rugby and these sort of bonds that you've got and just that sort of just that means of people gathering together, getting together, um, and it doesn't matter whether it's league or union. Um, yeah, it makes a massive difference. Um, one of the um, so not long, you know, not long after Rycroft died, very so my coach at Keith, so. Keithley Rugby Union was my club back up in Yorkshire, and my coach there as a junior and as a colt was Frank Frank Whitcomb Junior. Now he is part of this dynasty of rugby. Frank Whitcomb Senior was Bradford Northern Wales Great Britain um, Rugby League, um, part of the Great Britain Indomitable uh, Bulls Tour of nineteen forty six. His son. Uh, Frank was my was my coach in his playing days. Played for the North of England against the All Blacks. Was known as one of the best props in the country at the time. You know, played for Bradford when they were a big club. Um, his son Martin Whitcomb played for Leicester Tigers. Played for Natal. Uh, you know, stunning player. And then Martin's son is James Whitcomb, who now plays for Leicester. Tigers. So you've got four generations of prop forwards. And Martin very kindly invited me along to the unveiling of the Codebreakers um, statue uh, in Cardiff Bay. So that's um, Billy Boston, Gus Risman and Clive Sullivan, um, you know, which, you know, uh, and... Yeah, it was a strange thing being sort of sat there in the immediate aftermath of losing Rycroft, but I was there with Martin, um, Jim Mills, big Jim Mills, you know, like the legendary rugby league figure was there. Um, Gareth Edwards was there, you know, like it just, and I look back and I think, you know, it is a, it's a strange time, those sort of days and weeks after your child dies and it, it makes me, you know, well, I was really happy that, um, at, you know, at a tough time, can go and do something like that and be, you know, you know, there's sort of, 
the sort of glamour there, I guess, but it, it wasn't really, you know, a, a, about the, you know, like the stars and the names. It's just that big sort of warm hug that you get from rugby and it doesn't matter whether it's league or union um and yeah think about that a lot so so yeah i feel i feel lucky to have that support that i've got through being a rugby person and having been a rugby person all my life yeah yeah amazing stories um i was there that night at philomena's by the way i came along for that i was too late <laughs> i missed the group photo but i was there i was there all the same um and you mentioned there about uh, raising money. You've raised, you've managed to raise a huge chunk of money. Talk yeah. about that second and exactly who it's going to and, and why. Yeah. So we wanted to, we wanted to raise money for like, I mean, the, there were others as well that we could have, but we, we, we thought three was about, about right to make sure we acknowledge the, the main, um, groups that had been biggest in Rycroft's story. So Colchester Children's Ward, he spent a lot, you know, he only lived 16 months. Uh, he spent a lot of time on Colchester Children's Ward and the care that he got there was hugely important to him and also to us. Uh, SDS UK is a uh, charity to support Schwatman Diamond Syndrome um, uh, uh, sufferers and their and their families and because it's a very rare disease it, obviously it's not at the front of the queue when it comes to research when it comes to support uh public understand you know there's a like there have been examples of people of of children who've been undiagnosed with sds and social services getting involved because they presume that there's some like neglect going on you know because because you know you can't be you say you're feeding your child but what you know like at the look at the look at the wane scales and and so with a rare condition you know that's at the very sharp end but there's all these things that come out of a rare condition that make life even more difficult um than it would be for you know a similar condition that's 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 more common and SDS UK really help all those families and all those people with that. And then um, Great Ormond Street, Fox Ward is where they do the stem cell transplants, the bone marrow transplants. So yeah, people have been amazing. We managed to, so we've already raised 60,000 um, pounds for those charities. So um, they've, they've already, we've already been able to give 20,000 to Colchester Children's Ward, 20,000 to SDS UK. I'm going down to um, Great Ormond Street uh, on April the 8th to hand over um, their 20 grand. But we don't see that as being the end of it. Um, we we know that um, people people really care about this. People have been moved by Rycroft's story. And we also know, you know, so that's the rugby thing. So on the 20th of April, we've got the Rycroft, Rycroft's Rugby Rumble, which is... Um, Old Colfeans, it's at Old, Col Old Colfeans are hosting it. So, you know, a massive thanks to Rob Garner, who's chairman there, and everyone else down there who's helping out with that. Um, and they're playing against Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge alumni. So that's my old, um, that's my old team. I was captain of Fitz when I was an undergrad. Um, and Bradford Grammar School, Old Bradfordians, uh, which is obviously my my old school. So it's a it's a round robin. Um, day there'll be loads of rugby, should be loads of loads of fun, and I'm hoping it's the sort of thing that can be an annual event because, like, part of it is, you know, you wake up in the morning and you know that you got your jobs as a dad, you know that you're going to be, you know, like there's all these sort of things that you're going to have to do, and yeah, and that's and that's true with Lyra. Um, but I wake up and I wake up every morning as Lyra's dad and with, you know, practical things I have to do for Lyra. Um, I wake up every morning and I will always wake up every morning as Rycroft's dad. And I'm not going to be changing any more nappies and I'm not going to be making him feeds. Um, but I'm still going to wake up as Rycroft's dad. And so, 
this, yeah, this, I, 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 I know that whether it's next year, 10 years, 20 years time, there's still going to be this drive to remember him. And the best way to remember him is helping other kids who are in a similar situation to him and where it's still in the balance and they could still be going, you know, going home happy and healthy um, and living long and, and fulfilling um, lives. So, so yeah, so, and, and again, through being a rugby person, through knowing how much we all enjoy those sort of old boys games and old girls games uh, and knowing how they can grow and gain momentum, this, you know, right across Rugby Rumble it is on 20th of April this year. And I'm hope I'm hoping it's a really great day. And I'm I'm reasonably confident that it'll be right across Rugby Rumble two in 2025 and 2026. We've got Rumble three, and we can just keep going and keep building, keep just keep the money ticking over and keep helping other other children like Rycroft, because there'll always be uh, that need to 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 help them. And and I always have that need to be doing things to to do right by Rycroft, um, even as the years roll on. Yeah, hundred percent. Now we spoke off air just beforehand. Um, and yeah. One of the um, that will really help is is bone marrow being available. Now yes. tell people what you told me before about the number of yeah. bone marrow uh, p- uh, patients there are. Well, this is one of the things that and part of the reason why I feel a responsibility is that I now know quite a lot of things that I didn't know before and that, you know, the vast majority of people that I talk to are surprised by. And, you know, we'll we'll test it out, see if the people watching and listening are surprised by this. Um, When we took Rycroft onto the ward, uh, the nurse, just as a sort of little aside, said, um is the donor german and we said uh yes how how did you know and she went ha ha they're always german all right all right well if it's a little in joke on the ward what's going on there and it turns out germany even if you adjust for um for population so it's more than this in reality but if you adjust for population uh germany's still got three times as many people on their um stem cell bone marrow register uh, as we do in the uk and i've talked to a lot of people i've talked to mps talked to the charities talked to civil servants no one's got a really clear explanation as to why this is like they are not you know they they aren't um opt out or anything like that um so then the question is 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 that actually true that only three percent of the british population want to be on the bone marrow register, I I just don't I don't buy it, and it's not been my experience. A lot of people I've spoken to be like, "Oh, I'd go on that," and then they'll say, "Well, do you know that Anthony Nolan only takes people up to the age of 30? And then you're like, "Well, all oh, right, you know." And a lot for a lot, you know, a lot of people are ruled out by that. Um, so at the moment, and what I'm working, to, I'm 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 still at early stages of this, but to me, it's something where, given that, you know, right cross condition, SDS, Schwachmann diamond syndrome is very rare, um, but leukemia isn't. Um, conditions that require bone marrow transplants, stem cell transplants, they aren't, uh, you know, by, by serious illness standards, they're not rare. Um, I'd be surprised if there were, you know, it must be, there must be a 90 plus uh, percent um, name recognition for leukemia I'd have thought but um, at the moment it seems like the majority of people don't know much about how you become a bone marrow transplant donor what it what it takes um, how you get on the register when you need to get on it and so I'm hoping as well as with the fundraising been talking to other people who've been doing this for longer than I have. And I'm hoping that we can move towards a more systematic, you know, 
in a way, it goes back to what we were talking about. You know, how do we recruit third team rugby players? Because we want more third team rugby players because it, it's fun and enjoyable. How do we recruit more people to be on the donor register? Because um, you know, you can now that is that is a serious matter because if you've got more people on the donor register, then you are getting more matches, you're also getting better quality of matches. So if you you know, so Rycroft went ahead with a 10 out of 12 um, match. And he had two 12 out of 12 matches, but they were they were both female donors and apparently a 10 out of 12, um, but male to male is better than a 12 out of 12 <laughs> female to male. Yeah. So, so if you got on scale, not just more matches, but better matches, you are going to get better survival rates. You're going to get better. You're going to get more um, children, more people of all ages going home, and from their from their um, from their transplant and staying home and getting better and better and and being able to put it put it behind them and concentrate on living you know living life and just getting on with things. So so yeah, that's. That's the other element of it. And I'm prepared, you know, I know from my work and from, you know, like, you know, all sorts of things, changing anything big takes time and there'll be frustrations with it. And, um, you know, you go down cul-de-sacs with it and what have you. But that feels like I just do not buy that we are topping out at 3% of the population on the register. That just strikes me as nonsense. I think, uh, well, I think it should be north of fifty percent. I, th- I think north of fifty percent of people would want to be on that register if they knew fully what it mattered, you know, what why it mattered and what what it involves. And I'm prepared to spend quite a lot of what I've got of the rest of my life, seeing if that's the case. And it might be we have a chat. <laughs> on the amateur rugby podcast in 30 years where you go, Foz, you were wrong about all that stuff. And I'll be like, yeah. But I'll at least have uh have given it a go and seen um seen if we can get somewhere with it. Yeah. And, and what can people do to help uh, in that respect? Is there yes. something they can do? Well, you know, what what sort of options sure. do people I'd say first thing to do, get on the um Anthony Nolan website and just see, you know, like it particularly so if you are male under 30, then you, they want you. If you're from any ethnicity other than white British, they they want you. And that includes, you know, like genuinely like proper great granddad stuff. You know, like you might be, um, you know, so, so <laughs> all I've got seven um, great grandparents from Bradford and one from just outside Bradford. Um, but if if that one from just out, you know, if 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 they were, you know, from somewhere outside the country, then I would be of interest because because there might be someone with just that mix who needs a a a transport. So if there's any sort of interesting mix in your uh, heritage, then there might be someone else who's got a similar uh, mix, you know, and that that raises the importance of you. Um, having a look at it and it might be that actually even if you're above 30 you might be someone's best shot Um, but the main thing would be to say to people you know and particularly 16 to to 24 25 year olds like have you thought about this have a look at it you know it it, answer you know it can only be a cheek swab literally you know a cheek swab it's not like uh, uh, you know, it's less invasive than a COVID test. And by getting on that register uh, and by talking to other people about it, you're raising the awareness of it. You're hopefully helping to raise the numbers. And it might just be that there's someone waiting, waiting for you to save their life. And and it and and that's no hyperbole. Um, it saves lives. Uh, it, it it transforms lives. And so I couldn't recommend it more highly. Anthony and Olin would be my first port call if I was them. Okay, amazing. Um, before we move on to the stash section of the show, yes. do, you, do you want to 
you want to sum up? Is there anything else you want to say at all? Just any sort of closing thoughts on, on what we've spoken about so far? Well, with the well, I just say, I mean, if anyone's interested in what's going on, then rycroftforever.com is what we've set up as being the hub of it, you know, because it's what we do is change, you know, like it's evolving, changing. Uh, we've got loads of events, what have you, but we'll always use you know, like rycroftforever.com. That'll be the place where if you want to find out what we're up to, um, then, then yeah, there it is. And um, I don't know, like I, I found it the best consolation that we could have. You know, I think there is that, um, like a, a, a good mate who is not with us anymore. Um, said to me uh, that his experience of grief was that um, the, t- the toughest part is not the immediate bit, but it's the bit where, you know, after a while, everyone has to, you know, it wasn't their, you know, it wasn't their close relative. And so everyone has to go back to normal after a bit. And that is when grief and loss is hardest. And And to me, being able to, do something positive, being able to to just keep fighting, you know, like keep him alive, keep him in our minds and and keep, you know, sort of keep being Rycroft's dad is is been what 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 we've you know what we've needed really. And yeah, so it's it's great to have the opportunity to talk it through with with you tim and to share it with with your audience who um who i don't know might be might be going through similar might be might might want to you know might hear the story and and want to help in some way yeah well listen mate it's my honor to have to have done this and i'm very grateful that you've shared us what you have um let's move on let's move on to the stash section of your stash so uh so let's get into that right now what is your favorite bit of stash that you've ever received it's funny that because i was thinking <laughs> it, it it brought to my mind my, my most awful bit of stash <laughs> first of all the best bit i am still using a kit bag that i was given by um by cambridge university um so i was invited I only and I, I played for I played for the first team um, a bit, but mainly mainly when you know it was like post post varsity match. So uh, by that point, the um, you know the older the older lads who play against Oxford had picked up injuries and what have you. So I I got to play against the Navy and stuff like that. But they had some beautiful um, yeah like sort of cotton trader uh, bags and what have you, and you know. Like to be fair, that's I mean it's good for the environment, isn't it? That I must have got that in two thousand and one, two thousand and two. I'm still dumping my boots in it. Um, <laughs> I, I might, there's bits I've had to p- patch up with uh, gorilla tape and what have you, but um, yeah, I think it'll outlive me that bag. Um, yeah, it's a great bit of yeah, it's a great bit of kit, um, but. Yeah, more widely. I didn't know if this was a reference to my because my Instagram um, account is so my my Twitter account is me talking about all sorts of you know stuff, but um, mainly rugby league. But my Instagram account is deliberately one note, and that's all my my collection of um, rugby shirts. Like mainly, so I, I tend to mainly put the rugby league stuff on there. Um, I'm a bit of a yeah, I've got a bit of a soft spot for like the heavyweight, you know, like North Sydney Bears, Barmain Tigers. Um, like maybe my favourite is uh, Kempton Quagga Zebras, who are a <laughs> South Af- defunct South African rugby league team. And you you'd be surprised to know, yeah, zebra pin um, rugby shirt, but in a in a subtle way, Tim. Like in a yeah, to wear it out on a night out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's my and I, I I guess I yeah so I've got so in the next the the um the garages behind me 
and that's all laid out with it, it does need a bit of a tidy but um that's um yeah wall to wall rugby kits so i've got i've got my sort of ends with um sort of shirts i've been given shirts that i've i've played in and what have you and then i've got my um hardcore 90s rugby league polyester and then i've got the nice australian cotton ones and yeah no it's um yeah yeah it's my <laughs> it's it's my it's my go to place it's my happy place to just sit there yeah. <laughs> surrounded by polyester and cotton <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so what is your? Uh, this is a big question then for you. What's your favourite kit of all time? You can only have oh. one. Any well, team, any. So this, I mean, like the Rycroft shirt is based on. So in the night, the Bradford Northern. I mean, like even the name, you know, like the nickname was the Steam Pigs, and were known as a sort of like quite a dour team, uh, forward dominated. Uh, not really very Hollywood. And then out of the blue, 1993, they just um, adopted a purple, yellow and green away kit and you know, in, in hoops. And so like that has always been. So I I, ended up, I mean, like Rycroft ended up getting a cardigan knitted by his grandma in those purple, yellow and green colours, which always prompted questions from the nurses because they're like, you know, they've never seen her. A home knit like that. So yeah, Bradford Northern, uh manufactured by Elgrin, had Jumbo Vorx breweries, Sunland, Vork, big Vorx sponsor over the front. Yeah, very much of its time, but yeah, I'd say that's my favourite shirt of all time. Fine choice, fine choice. <laughs> what about awful what about awful kits for us? What's what would you rather burn yeah. than wear? I do remember a good mate of mine. He was my predecessor as captain at Fitz, um, uh, Gaz Bateman. Um, he ordered he ordered some training tops, and they turned up, and they were like bouncers puffer jackets. They were just like they were made of a material that sort of reminded you of bin liners, but was weirdly stiff as well. With sort of sharp, <laughs> like any time you folded your arm, they were like sharp edges. Um, yeah, we all bought them, and then we never wore them. It's like, what? How did we end up with these? Um, yeah, I wish. But now I wish I had one for you know, like for old times' sake. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be lurking. I've, I've got to do. I've got to help my mum clear out the loft. So that might be that might be one of those little bits of gold. So so bad it's good, and um, sort of things. I hope I dig that one out. Yeah, oh, amazing, amazing answer. Now we've kind of we kind of said all this already, but people want to get a hold of you, find out more about what you're doing, everything to do with Rycroft. It's on the screen right now, and it's Rycroft RycroftForever.com. Um, yes. Any any final words for us before we uh, we head off? Just to say, yeah, keep going, you guys. You know, like everything we talked about today. You know, we talked about league and union. We talked about like keeping the lower teams going, the third teams. Talked about Rycroft and and how hard things can be uh, when we're in hospital all the time, and then even harder when when you lose someone. And it's just about it's just about keeping going. I think that you you know while 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 there's life, there's hope, and even beyond you know like. Even beyond it, um, I think we're pretty lucky that we we're living in a sort of time of history where we can devote time and energy to 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 things like rugby and and it it's part about you know it just makes being a person you know it's it's a way to enjoy being a person, isn't it? League union it's a way to enjoy being a person, being with people. Um, it, it it just enriches our lives, and so it's helped it's helped us celebrate Rycroft and raise money for Rycroft, and um, but it's it's just a great thing, and I feel very lucky to to have come across rugby 
to you know <laughs> not just one code but two and and for it be to be you know a big part of my life and um pretty pretty confident it'll always be a massive part of my my life till uh you know till whenever my final day is so brilliant to have the opportunity to to talk about it with you tim you know like really uh really love what you've done with this with this podcast and uh and, it, and it's great to to take part yeah amazing mate um yeah just want to sort of echo everything you've said there and thank you so much for being so open and sharing and i'm sure i'm certain it will benefit even if it's just one person out there i'm sure it'll have some benefit everything people at home we've mentioned will be listed in the show notes below which you can find in one place and that's at amateur rugby podcast Dot com. So it just leaves me to say, Foz, once again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim. All right, there he goes. What um, what a heartbreaking story, frankly. Thank you, Foz, so much for sharing, being so open about it and being so brave, really, to come on and talk. And like I said just now, I think it really will benefit people um, going forward. Okay. Back during the Great Rugger Run, all the previous three years, I visited hundreds of rugby clubs and a common theme was uh, teams, clubs, really struggling with their social media at times. I'm considering getting together a few resources, a bit of advice um, in some free uh, training, basically. So if you think your club is struggling somewhat in social media or you think it could be better in some way, then go to amateurrugbypodcast.com forward slash social and sign up and just let me know what you're having issues with, what your problems are, so that I can get a, a wider idea of that. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff if you like. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. And until then, get out and play. <laughs>